welcome to the Governance for Schools Conference 2022, sponsored by the Institution of Engineering and Technology. My name is Oliver Keane, and I'm really happy to welcome you here today on behalf of Governance for Schools. This morning, we're really pleased to be joined by Steve Barker and Linda Waghorn of Better Governor, a national information and consultancy service for school governors in England. Today, Steve and Linda will be taking a look at what effective practice means for us all as we start the 2022-23 school year. As I'm sure many of you will be aware, Steve and Linda present regular webinars for us throughout the school year on important and timely topics for governors. And you'll be able to find details of this terms programme on our website in due course. But I have a few housekeeping tips before we get started. Today's session is being recorded and will be shared with you via email after the conference. And this should be by the end of the week, we hope. Uh, the session today is CPD accredited by the CPD certification service. And you can get a complimentary certificate to confirm this after the conference. If you'd like one, you'll need to fill in the post webinar survey and confirm you're happy for us to share your name and email with the, with the service. And they'll issue and send your certificate to you by email, although this can take up to 28 days. You're welcome to post questions in the Q&A feature, and we'll try and get to as many as we can, though um, we know these sessions are often crammed full, so we'll do our best. Um, you can also join the conversation on Twitter at hashtag GFSConference2022 and share your views there. So without any further delay, I'll hand over to Steve and Linda. Good morning, everybody. Um, sorry, I'm having a few technical issues my end, so uh, you might have to bear with me. My uh, my screen has decided to uh, elude me, so I've uh, thankfully I have a paper copy of uh, my slides in front of me. But uh, uh, a very warm welcome to uh, this session, and thank you, Ollie, for that introduction. Um, hopefully, the slides are uh, moving on. Um, Linda, you may have to actually tell me whether um, you can see the slide at the moment, because I can't see anything, I'm afraid. No, I've just got the, um, the title slide, so some, some support from Governors for Schools on moving that on might, might be needed. Whilst we're trying to um, uh, resolve, resolve the screen, because I'm afraid I can't see anything at all, so I'm hoping that something is actually happening in the background. Um, Ollie, are you able just to confirm whether we we've got the ability to actually override what's going on at the moment. Yeah, um, Ollie has got our uh, title slide, the, the picture slide of us, uh, Steve, is now being displayed. Lovely. OK, so if we can revert to the next slide, next slide, please, then in that case. So apologies, folks, slight, te slight technical problems just when you don't need them. Um, the slide that hopefully you can see at the moment is a photograph of uh, Linda and myself, but you can see us in real life, so you can uh, realise that mine's slightly flattering. Um, it's an old photograph, in other words. Uh, Linda and I are here from Better Governor, and we're thrilled to be partnering with uh, Governors for Schools for their um, 2022 conference. Um, we are regular uh, presenters on uh, Governors for Schools, and we're uh, very thrilled to be able to uh, uh, join you this morning. Uh, the aims of today's session, if we could actually put the um, uh, next slide up, please, Ollie, are hopefully what you would expect from us at this stage. I mean, what we want to do is think about, as the title of this webinar actually uh, suggests, what does good governance actually look like for schools in the autumn term of 2022? And obviously, as we're moving forward into uh, the new year um, in January. Um, I think there's lots going on um, around education at the moment. It doesn't seem there's very much going on in education from the government's perspective. But nonetheless, there are some key drivers in education right now. And I think it's really important that as governors, we think about how uh, they should be informing our practice um, in terms of uh, the way these discussions look. And of course, what we also want to think about is individually and also collectively as governors, how we can contribute towards better governance in our schools, uh, which of course is something that all of us are uh, very, very keen on. Okay, so we want to um, start off, if we could move to the, uh, the next slide, please, by just thinking about a little bit of uh, uh, a backdrop to this discussion. And of course, the backdrop to effective governance anywhere or to good governance is thinking about what are the expectations of government, what are the expectations of good practice in our schools. And most of these, for Linda and I, are actually encapsulated within these two documents that are actually up on the screen for you now. Um, certainly, the uh, first one of those 
is very much um, something that hopefully you'll all be familiar with. The governance handbook is something that was actually last um, updated in October 2020. We've been threatened with a new one for quite some time now, but obviously with all of those changes that have been happening in terms of uh, who sits at the uh, Secretary of State's chair in the Department of Education recently, um, that's probably been a little bit of a casualty. But we know that one is actually being prepared at the moment and we should see that uh, being published anytime soon. Governor's Handbook is all about expectation, but of course it also covers all of the statutory requirements, or not perhaps all of them, but an awful lot of the statutory requirements on governance as well. Competency framework on the right-hand side of the screen is also about expectation, but this is very much an aspirational view. Uh, it's really the, the competency areas match the headings of the chapters in the governance handbook, and it's all about us as governors thinking about what does best practice in governance look like. Don't be put off by the date of January 7, 2017. Uh, Linda and I are firm believers that these competencies and what they represent in terms of good practice are as relevant today at the uh, tail end of 2022 as they were when they were first written. And there's something that all of us in governance can actually aspire to. Linda, shall I uh, hand over to you at the next slide? Very happy for you to do that. Thank you. So thinking about our role uh, at that top uh, level and then drilling down from that is a really good way of starting the conversation and thinking about what we do in our governing board meetings is is very clearly defined by the quality of our conversations discussions and the type of questions and the way in which we build our understanding so hopefully what we will do through the rest of this um, uh, session this morning is really build uh, what that might look like uh, at the beginning of this uh, new academic year and moving in into the next year and pinning against that the challenges that uh, our school communities might have as a result of that. So underpinning whatever it is we do in our school is that clarity that we have about where our organisation is going, the ethos and the values which drive it, and the strategic priorities for the coming year. So those strategic priorities or the strategic direction of the school towards the um, delivery of its, its vision, it's really clear that as governors, we understand what that is, that it is driven by some real detail about the context, the performance, and the uh, risks and challenges that our school faces as an organisation and the result of um, that understanding and some of you may have had your first meetings um, in your schools as as have I um, that you have some kind of draft or school development plan that sets out what it is your school uh, academy is going to do over the coming year to move your organization forward against that vision, against that, uh, those uh, values that you have, your ethos, but based on what you know about your pupils' performance. Everything is predicated upon that because the second two functions of governance, and these, is your, these are your headline statutory functions, the next two are predicated upon that deeper understanding. The first is to hold the head teacher to account for the performance of the school and its pupils and therefore also for staff performance because they are your delivery arm of your school development plan and the second one which is a little bit more challenging in, in current circumstances is overseeing the financial performance of the school and making sure that what the school spends its money on has real value and impact so the statutory function of governance hasn't changed but it is really important that at this time of the year, we understand what our school development plan looks like. We understand why those strategic priorities are there, because they are based on that fundamental understanding of performance, challenge and risk. So let's uh, think about that in a little bit more detail, the, uh, lined up against the, um, the, the competency framework, lined up against the um, the role that we have, if we can move on to the next slide, Ollie, um, what we have then is 
sections of the competency framework. And if we pull out those functions from that, there is a clear uh, reason here for that strategic leadership. As governors, we are in leadership positions as a board. We all will have a lead uh, role to play, whether we've got linked roles or a committee structure. Our strategic leadership is very important in, in driving the school forward. That enables that accountability, that understanding of what we hold the school to account for and what information, evidence, data we might receive in order to do that. Uh, and then finally, we have a role to ensure that compliance is achieved and compliance is around making sure that our school is compliant with all its legal duties and responsibilities. And largely those come at certain times of the year and your clerk is key here in ensuring that those compliance activities are reflected in the agenda and you undertake uh, that role of holding to account. For example, at this time of the year, the safeguarding um, role in governance in schools has changed in accordance with the latest Keeping Children Safe in Education. And therefore, in the autumn meetings, we would expect to see uh, policy changes, uh, training for staff updated, and therefore that information, the accountability measure, we will ensure compliance by asking questions, seeing that evidence, holding to account, and being able to assure ourselves that the school is compliant with uh, the, the role that it has in, in safeguarding. So if we move on uh, to the next slide and understanding that these three uh, roles are the ones that are, will feature most on our agendas, if we move on, we are now thinking about what drives our governance, what brought us into governance, what should be topmost in our mind when we're attending our meeting, when we are conducting um, those um, roles of monitoring visits, of uh, discussions, of asking questions, of reading our papers. What is the headline there here? So Ollie, again, if we, if we can just pull up the, the next message here. Uh, this is from the guidance. Uh, and what, what we are talking about here is ensuring that every child who is in our school leaves our care at the end of their time with us, fully prepared for the next stage of their education or the world of work, if we're talking about a secondary moving into apprenticeship onto further education or into university. It is ambitious, so we don't accept that, oh, well, this is the circumstances here. There is nothing more that we can expect. This is being ambitious for all of the children in our school and whatever the circumstances they find themselves in. We're gonna say a little bit more about changing circumstances in a moment. So this is, this is the driver. It's not because Ofsted is going to come and call at our door and is going to give us a mark in the box. This is about what we do because it is our duty to the pupils in our school. We are advocates for the children that are currently in our school and that will be coming to us in the future. We hold uh, that ambition for all of our pupils and that's our up, should be uppermost in our mind in everything that we do. So what are the priorities if we're looking at the current year? If we move on to the next slide, Ollie, we'll see that the landscape of, of what we are expecting is driven largely by these th three things. So pupil performance is, is uppermost in our mind. We, we must know the context of our children in our school. We must know how well they are doing what groups of pupils we might have that may need extra support and how that is being delivered. The second strand is around uh, balancing our budget. We're going to say a little bit more detail against each of these uh, areas in a moment. So we will know from uh, both national uh, and from uh, our own governance uh, in our schools that finance has been tight for some time in all schools and it has got tighter in the last little while and, and we'll explore why that is and what we might need to be doing about that. Uh, and then finally, the last strand we're going to explore in this session is about every child uh, in our school and making sure 
that whatever the circumstances we find um, affecting our pupils, that there is support, understanding, uh, and um, a real deep knowledge within the school of our families and our children, so that support and signposting to uh, additional help can be put in place at the earliest opportunity. Sorry, Linda, just to jump in there, just to explain to everybody. Um, apologies, folks. I think uh, Ollie's actually sharing his screen because mine wasn't working. Um, Ollie's clearly got um, uh, an Apple machine because it doesn't like the formatting. So when you get the copy of our slides, um, all of these things will be legible. So uh, apologies if there's a few issues with the uh, some of the formatting jumping around. Thank you, Steve. So if we, if we move forward to a slide and we start to unpick what we mean by pupil performance. Uh, and this is about, as I said in that, uh, in that first slide about our functions, knowing and understanding uh, what uh, the results of the assessment and exams that uh, our young people undertook uh, earlier this year, what that told us about the performance of our pupils and um, what we are going to do as a school as a result of that understanding. So what did our results say? Were they in line with our expectations? Uh, has the support that we've put in place had an impact? Are we going to continue as a school doing the same kinds of supportive uh, activities? Or have we, as a result of what we've done, uh, when the school has uh, analyzed that at operational level, are they making suggestions of things that uh, might work better or have worked better in doing more of those things that work well and less of those things that have had less uh, impact. So it's about that, that deep understanding, not just about all pupils, but breaking that down into those groups of pupils, um, disadvantaged pupils, pupils that um, have a whole range uh, of uh, different challenges or expectations. And this is very much bound up with understanding the impact that the pandemic has had upon uh, your school population and also about the um, results of what the school has put in place uh, to mitigate uh, some of those uh, some of the, that impact so for example it was easier for children to pick up on maths and keep going with their maths but it was more difficult for reading and writing uh, at length to have been carried out uh, with remote education to a standard that we might have expected if children were in school every day. So it is, those are the common threads, but every school is very unique and different. And so every school should have, a, every governing board should have an understanding of what has been the impact of COVID, where are you now? And what are the other things that are, are um, are impacting on uh, the performance of uh, those different groups of pupils. Uh, and importantly, asking the so what questions as a governor, not as bluntly as that, I would, uh, I would hope, but in your discussions, in your reading of the papers, in your um, questions that you ask, what has the school done about that? I'll give you an example of that. We had a board meeting last night uh, we looked at um, booster groups for uh, pupils who were from our disadvantaged uh, uh, community and we had put in place uh, using some of our uh, COVID support funding uh, some breakfast booster clubs but what we actually found as a school had happened is those parents didn't or weren't able for a variety of reasons to get their children to school at that earlier time. They struggled in some cases to get their children to school at the regular time. So that um, program has been uh, stopped because it wasn't having any impact. And instead that support is being delivered in a different way during the school day, recognizing that um, that wasn't as effective as it could have been. So it's important to understand what the school has done about it, how that has been the impact of that work and how that's been adjusted if it hasn't had the impact it was designed to have. So again, that's picking up uh, on that next bullet point, the impact of those interventions so far. And then knowing how the 
work that um, your teachers do in collecting uh, assessment of pupils throughout the year are shared with parents. Um, again, an example of that is uh, the school that I'm a chair at has increased the frequency of reporting to parents so that they are more aware of um, their children's uh, progress. And this is supplemented by uh, more information about what their children are learning via the weekly uh, newsletters that allows parents to have conversations with their children. We're very aware that for some of our disadvantaged children, their parents struggle with reading as well. So it's important that we find other mechanisms to, uh, to make sure that parents are engaged with their pupils' learning. Uh, and understanding that data, when and if it is published, so we haven't got published data yet for secondary, that will be coming. If you're a secondary governor, you will have that information um, uh, later on uh, in the term. But uh, with the primary data, although that is not being collated into a wider um, performance tables by the, the Department of Education, there is likely to be some engagement of your local authority in sharing or across your map what performance has been against national or maybe against some of the um, some of the collaborative groups of schools that you might be working with in your location. So moving on to the next slide, I just wanted to make a, a point um, about context of your school. And I've made a couple of, of comments about the context of my particular um, governance um, in the school that I'm engaged with, but it is about developing your understanding of your school community. Every school is unique. Um, in a secondary school, you've got a much larger population. You've probably got a larger range of geographical spread uh, in terms of your community. And it is important that we understand what the current situation for our pupils looks like. What is our context? Has it changed? Have we got uh, larger groups of children in some uh, that we're looking at in some detail because uh, there have been greater challenges? Uh, is, uh, has performance changed for some pupils? And this isn't only about those children who are disadvantaged, although the national research and our own data in, in our schools shows that disadvantaged pupils have uh, suffered the most in terms of the gaps in their education, uh, but don't lose sight of all the groups um, of pupils that you look at in your school. That overarching duty is to ensure that all pupils leave your school as well prepared for their next stage of education as possible. So it is about those children who are more able and the, the opportunities that they may have missed out on in the, um, in the pandemic because we weren't able to give them those opportunities remotely in the same way that they might have, have had those opportunities uh, when they were in school, the kinds of activities or extension um, activities or visits that we might have put in place to build uh, and expand their, their learning. The group of children that sits in the middle there, they are meeting those expectations, but we mustn't um, forget that they are a large group and that we need to make sure that um, we have returned to offering a wide range of, of, of clubs, for example, and, and sporting and other activities that meet the needs of all of our pupils in a more uh, diverse way. And thinking about those pupils who um, didn't get to sit their GCSEs, but they have sat their um, A-levels and moved on to university. That next group of pupils coming up behind, they now are thinking about uh, their opportunities in going to university. And are we concentrating enough support and attention on being ambitious, so their aspirations for their future, and, and making sure that we look at each of those groups and that we do understand how uh, COVID may have impacted and what our school or college is doing about um, supporting and through to those aspirations. Thanks, Linda. Um, 
can we move the slide on now, Ollie? Thank you. And what we're going to do on the next bit, folks, is actually just uh, focus on um, this second priority that uh, we've identified at the moment. And uh, I think some of the animation will actually work on here. So I don't know whether you want to put, put them all up at the same time, Ollie, but just in case. But there are four key drivers at the moment, I think, for governance. And Linda and I are very keen to share with governors the idea that, you know, we are heading all of us, irrespective of whether we are sitting in schools or in trusts at the moment that have positive balances, we are heading into territory where the challenge of balancing the school budget, which is a statutory responsibility of all schools, of course, is actually being challenged quite severely at the moment, probably more so than has been the case um, certainly for the last 40, 50 years or so. So the first box on the, uh, um, the this diagram we've got on the slide at the moment is talking about teacher salaries. It doesn't matter about the context of the what this is, but purely a reference point, really. But teacher salaries, we're still waiting for the um, school teachers paying conditions document to be published. Uh, we anticipate that that could happen this week. It might be next week, but uh, a lot of you will have pay committees, etc., um, planning to meet to talk about uh, recommendations from head teachers. The worry on this is that all the indications thus far is that the government will not be funding this um, um, pay award this year. Um, some of the um, awards that are being given, particularly for newly qualified teachers or early career framework teachers, as they're called now, are very much sort of up there in line with inflation. Um, inflation was a lot lower when they were planned, I think, but many schools had actually um, budgeted for a two or three percent increase this year, where it looks like the average cost is actually going to be near a five. That's not funded, so schools have to find that money out of their budget. Similarly, um, support staff, that's all other staff in schools except teachers, their pay award has actually just been increased on a national, but sorry, just been approved rather, I should say, on a national basis in July. And the implications of that are because that's backdated to April um, for the most part, those increases as well will have an impact on our budgets, of course, and they are not increases again that have actually been funded. So right the way across the whole pay spectrum in schools at the moment, that represents some budgetary pressure as far as we're concerned. The bottom left um, quadrant picture there uh, is about school meals, of course, and one of the issues that we've actually got is that uh, funding for school meals has not been increased, but general inflation, and we're using school meals just as an indicator, there are lots of areas in our, in our budgets as uh, governors, in our schools, and in our trusts, where inflationary pressures are actually coming to bear. There's a national campaign being led by some um, very active uh, head teachers and some of the head teacher associations at the moment, talking about the fact it's now costing more to deliver free school meals than schools are actually getting in terms of uh, funding from the government to do so. And uh, that, along with the increased cost of uh, resources, etc., is uh, bringing uh, quite a lot of inflationary pressure onto our budgets at the moment. And last but by no means least, of course, the meter in the bottom one there is supposed to represent energy prices. We all know that those have skyrocketed. The government did announce some measures on um, Thursday last week which do imply that schools will be treated like businesses and there will be some capping. Uh, the problem is the cap applies after the increases have already happened. And I think many of you will be aware that there's over 100% increase from uh, last year's costs. So all of these things together uh, combine to create a situation which is threatening and challenging for probably every school in the country, I would suggest. And as governors, we need to ensure that we are uh, very much um, part of uh, the dialogue that's happening on this. And on the next slide, uh, what we're actually um, really saying to governors is, well, let's think about inflation. Let's, let's not bury our heads in the sand. And uh, if you can just click on Ollie, the animation should work. Um, there are some suggestions that we're making here. Thank you. That um, as governors, what we need to do is ensure that we know what's happening in our schools. This is a broader landscape that we're talking about now than purely the academic side of our schools, because of course finance is the great enabler. We need finance in order for our schools to operate effectively and in order for us to ensure that uh, children and young people are uh, making appropriate progress in their learning. So we've got to be mindful of the impact of our staff pay awards. That's not just teachers, that's all pay awards, as I've said. 
we need to be ensuring that we've got accurate energy cost projections. Some of your schools, some of your trusts uh, will be um, tied up into uh, uh, fixed price deals that are ending at various points. Start looking or suggest school staff start looking at those areas already, irrespective of if the contract doesn't come to an end until next year, because this is going to have a dramatic impact on the way in which we're budgeting going forward. Is there a deficit on the cost of um, supplying free school meals on, in your school or trust? And again, bearing in mind Linda's comment about context, has there been an increase in the, uh, the number of claimants of free school meals? Because if so, that could actually be um, exacerbating the problem. And of course, one of the things that we need to think about is what does that do to the overall budget outlook? What are we projecting as an outturn in our school's budgets this year? Are we looking at an in-year budget deficit? Now, bear in mind that um, contrary to popular belief, there is no such thing as a deficit. Schools are not allowed to have a deficit. So you can have a licensed deficit where basically you are given a loan from the local authority if you're um, a maintained school, but you only get that when you have actually outlined a credible and believable plan for actually paying it back. In academies, the Education and Skills Funding Agency tends not to be quite so generous. They don't like deficits at all. And if a school is projecting an in-year deficit, then they will insist on cost-cutting measures to be made. So the implications of heading towards this deficit, even though we might have uh, some reserves in the bank, if we're heading towards an in-year deficit, that should start raising alarm bells for governors and we should start asking questions about what's happening to actually either change our revenue or change our cost base. And we'll say a little bit more about that on the, on the uh, next slide in just a moment. But of course, what we do need to make sure of is that as governors, we are seeing the budget outturn. In other words, the projection for where we're going to end the current financial year, but also our three-year plan or our five-year plan, what's happening there and what are the impact of all of those inflationary pressures. And these are not things that um, governors can actually afford to ignore. As we say, what we do need to be ensuring as governors and trustees is that our schools, our trusts are actually taking action. And on the next slide, what we're suggesting is some of the actions that uh, uh, we might want to take. And uh, the photograph, if uh, you haven't um, cottoned onto it yet, is supposed to uh, imply that uh, um, there is no money tree. We can't actually grow our way out of this. There are things that we have to take. So if you could actually uh, move the animations on, Ollie, that'd be great. Thank you. So as far as the taking actions are concerned, some of our suggestions are that what you might want to think about doing, this, this is an emergency. Um, if you're a fan of um, social media, there's a lot going on in social media this morning about uh, our current chancellor. Um, waiting eight weeks until he uh, um, makes an emergency statement. I don't think we have that luxury in schools at the moment. If we have got a situation which we know is threatening the financial viability of our schools and their ability to function, we ought to think about having an additional single focus meeting. And when I say single focus, I mean focusing purely on the financial issues facing us at the moment. And as governors, we should perhaps be calling for that uh, sooner rather than later. There are only two options if we're in a situation where uh, uh, money is short. One is that we increase our revenue, and two, of course, is that we actually try to reduce our costs. Now, increasing revenue isn't as easy as that, as I'm sure most people are actually aware. And one of the, one of the key ways of, uh, of doing that, of course, because of its significance in terms of the funding that we get from government, is looking at our admissions. We've got people doing uh, parental tours in schools at the moment, thinking about admissions for next September. How, um, how hard are we working to actually drive those? It puts schools in direct competition with each other, which is never um, ideal, of course, but we each of us want to maximize the admissions for our own schools, and we have to recognize the implications financially of doing that. Lettings we saw during the pandemic tailed off dramatically in an awful lot of schools because of the, the restrictions and the, uh, the, the lockdowns, et cetera, meant they just weren't possible. Are they building up? Are we maximizing? Are we optimizing the lettings and therefore the lettings income that we're getting? Again, questions that governors need to be asking. 
Um, we saw some um, quite significant reductions in the numbers of charitable donations being given to schools over lockdown because, again, the sort of events that parent-teacher associations, friends of schools, etc., were operating couldn't actually take place, and therefore the amount of money wasn't being raised. Hopefully, those are beginning to come back to uh, you know, pre-pandemic levels now. But we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that there are many, many grant making trusts out there in the world. Some of them have very specific criteria. And of course, it does mean time. Uh, I'm not suggesting, and uh, Linda would be the first one to say this, that we shouldn't actually confuse um, volunteering to do other things in our schools with our strategic roles as governors. But if we've got some time, sometimes for governors to actually just have a look at what's out there in terms of uh, potential grants, uh, grants available to schools, that can be a valuable source of income. But of course, most of us will be thinking the only realistic way that we can actually tackle some of the inflationary pressures at the moment is actually by reducing our costs. Now, lots of people are talking about energy reduction measures. Uh, Linda talked a little bit about the uh, trust where she's a chair. Um, I'm chair of a trust, but I'm also chair of a, uh, a um, maintained infant school, which occupies a very attractive uh, Victorian building. Uh, the scope for us um, putting any energy reduction measures in is pretty slim, to be perfectly honest, without significant cost. But some schools will be able to think about that. But to be honest, the doubling that we've already seen of energy costs, um, switching to uh, you know, a different form of, uh, of light bulbs, um, closing windows and uh, uh, removing all the ventilation features we put in last year because of the pandemic, are only going to scratch the surface, really. So that leaves us really with the only option that we've got because of its significance in our budgets is actually reducing, uh, uh, well, I'm sorry, not reducing, um, restructuring our staffing with a view to reducing the overall cost there. What we do need to think about, particularly if we're looking at staff restructuring, of course, is that penultimate bullet point on this slide. That's something that we do need to think about right now. Restructuring takes a long time. There's a statutory process that has to be compliant with uh, uh, employment law, but also mindful of teachers' pay and conditions um, and other staff's pay and conditions. So if we are looking at a, re a restructuring, it can take sometimes up to six months to actually get uh, the full impact of that to actually uh, be reflected in our budget and certainly in our reduced costs. So it's not something that we can wait and see, it's something that we need to start having discussions if that's appropriate in your setting right now. But above all, the, the most significant action we need to take is to ensure that finance is a recurring item on our agendas. We need to be closely monitoring performance against budget. We need to constantly be thinking about how our schools are actually responding to uh, what is a very difficult situation for them at this point in time. But Steve, there's just uh, there's a, one of the questions on the chat, and there are a number of questions that I hope have been answered as Steve has been speaking about these different um, aspects, particularly against the slide that's actually on screen at the moment. Uh, but there was a question around the responsibilities of a local governing board when it may not have the same kind of financial responsibilities uh, for, um, for its school because they're held at that trust level. And this is a question I've uh, had to ask myself. And I think for me, and Steve may want to add something to this, uh, because I know he's involved in, in that governance as well. It, it's For me, it was about asking of the trust board themselves, what is the impact of what they are doing at, uh, at trust board level? And is there any negative impact on the um, strategic priorities that we put in place in our school? So it's about, uh, for us, it was about understanding that the decisions that the trust board were having to make, very difficult decisions in, in some cases, were being made um, with that the least impact as possible on what is happening for our, our pupils. And they were able to give us, they came and uh, we had a representative from the trust board come to our local meeting and they were able to take questions for our board and give us that assurance that um, it was not leading to, uh, to any uh, reduction of resources for learning for our pupils. 
And I think it's worth bearing in mind that when we're talking about the way in which schools are financed, as I mentioned, schools are financed based on the number of pupils in them. Now, whether it's actually um, a trust or an individual school, it doesn't matter. The, the, the expectation is exactly the same, that the fu funding that we're getting for those pupils is actually being spent on them. So as Linda says, no trust is actually going to willfully uh, interrupt the uh, quality of education for uh, children. And of course, as Linda's demonstrated in her trust, there was a consultation there. And I think the thing that we should be um, looking at if you're operating at local um, governance level within a multi-academy trust is, you know, if you've got concerns, even if you're looking at some of the constraints you're facing, if you've got concerns, escalate them up. It's not just about waiting for things to come down the tree, shall we say, um, from the trust board. There should be a two-way communication process there. Okay, shall we uh, move on to uh, um, the next question? I'm afraid I can't see the uh, um, question panel, so I'm hoping that uh, we've responded, Linda said, to most of the questions there. What we're going to do, and if you can just run the animation on this one, I'll read that would be great, thank you, um, is think about the, um, again, this is linked to finance, but think about the social and economic deprivation and the impact that that's having in our schools. Now, Linda talked about um, you know, that third strand being every child matters. Of course it does. And that was a bit of a play on words. Of course, some of you will remember that uh, 20 years ago, there was a, um, a strand of the last Labour government's policy called Every Child Matters. And it was a very real drive to focus on raising aspirations, attainment, and uh, all other elements of schools work in terms of the impact they have on every single child in our schools. And I think what we're saying now is that, yes, of course, we have to keep that focus on all children, but certainly from a, an academic monitoring point of view, we absolutely need to be mindful of children operating at all levels. But what we can't lose sight of is that because of the inflationary pressures at the moment, um, we are facing a situation where there is quite likely to be, and there are, we're already seeing the signs of this in some schools, an increase in levels of deprivation, both socially and economically, as a consequence of what's going on in, uh, in, in our society right now. So these aren't necessarily going to happen in all of your schools. Um, it's not an exhaustive list, and you won't find all of them actually necessarily occurring at the same time. But they are potentially things that will have an impact on our schools. We will have more children and young people who are hungry. They haven't got food at home. They haven't eaten breakfast when they come to school. We will see um, in certain quarters an inability of parents and carers to be able to afford to pay for school meals, even though they may not be eligible for uh, free school meals. There's been a lot of concern about the cost of school uniforms. We've got new regulations in place now. And I think it's imperative for all of us as governors to make sure that we know what our school is actually doing in that regard. If we've got parents who can't afford school uniform, have we ensured that we've reviewed our suppliers um, with an intention of trying to minimize the, the overall cost outlay that's implied in um, um, compliance with the school uniform policy? Lots of schools are uh, operating secondhand uniform shops. Uh, lots of schools are uh, providing footwear as well as uniform to um, certain uh, children and families in particular hardship cases. But the things that we need to think about, and certainly from a context perspective, think about what's happening in our own schools. I just want to add to And there are elements of um, safeguarding and well-being, of course, which we also have to think about. Uh, something that we saw um, increase quite dramatically during the pandemic. Um, lots of people were then assuming and drawing conclusions that it was down to the fact that people were spending more time confined in quite small living spaces and getting on top of each other all the time. And that led to a spike in the instance of domestic abuse. And of course, domestic abuse is obviously damaging. It's damaging to all those who are impacted on it. But very often we overlook the impact it has on children and their mental health and well-being in our schools. It's not the only driver, of course, but it's something that we have to be mindful of. So as governors, we need to be asking questions of our designated safeguarding leads. Have staff received appropriate training to be able to recognize the signs of domestic abuse? And don't forget, domestic abuse 
isn't just domestic violence. That's a, a, a very unpleasant aspect of it, of course, but a lot of domestic abuse is actually verbal, emotional abuse. And if children are witnessing that, experiencing that for themselves, that's going to have a, a, a knock-on effect, of course. And then there are the wider mental health and well-being concerns that we have for children and young people in our schools. If they are not having the same quality of life as perhaps they enjoyed previously, then sit, obviously that's something that needs to be considered. And we need staff to be um, sympathetic, empathetic, but most of all, aware of what those indicators might be so that they can raise concerns. And hopefully then inter intervention can actually be put in place. So something to think about for all of us as governors, and again, this will depend on the context, as Linda said before, but how will we know if some of these um, factors are actually presenting themselves within our school communities? And for some of us, it might mean asking questions in our governing boards that perhaps we haven't um, asked in quite the same way before. And if we can move on to the next slide now, Ollie. Um, this is very much about um, the focus on some questions, particularly on this area that as, uh, as governors, we might want to either reflect on or perhaps ask at some um, upcoming meetings, etc. And a lot of these relate to that last slide, as I say, have we got hungry children in our schools? And if so, what are we doing about it? Because it's, you know, we can sit there wringing our hands and saying, oh, it's terrible, isn't it? But it would be much more beneficial for those children, and young people, if we could take some uh, proactive steps to actually improve that situation. Is our school or our trust monitoring changes in deprivation levels? Are we aware of what's happening with our context? So again, context is, is everything, as Linda said, but we need to be ensuring that school uh, does have eyes and ears on this. It's not something that as governors um, is our role to actually get uh, involved in, in terms of individual families, etc. But generally, in terms of our overview of schools, we ought to know because this does have an impact on, uh, on context. Do we operate a hardship fund? That might extend to uniform, it might go to things actually completely unrelated to that, but you know, some schools will be accessing charitable donations to actually enable children to participate in um, after school activities and other extracurricular uh, events, etc. Some schools will be using pupil premium for that, but increasingly now we are seeing pupil premium income diverted towards the National Tutoring Programme, for example. Schools have to top that up themselves, and uh, very often the um, cost of that is actually being met out of the pupil premium expenditure, which means that there aren't funds available necessarily without going elsewhere and looking for donations to support those pupils. Compliance and school uniform are talked about. Simple question there is, when did we last look at that as a governing board? If we haven't, it's something perhaps we should. New guidance was actually produced in June this year, and that's something all of us need to actually have uh, at the top of our minds. Mm, just, just a and the last one really um, is a question about staff CPD, professional training and development. Uh, have staff been fully um, trained in terms of their ability to recognize those signs of potential mental health concerns and those that link to domestic abuse? Mental health, we don't expect staff to be experts on mental health. We certainly don't expect them to be practitioners, but we do expect them to be able to spot some of the early indicators so that schools can then signpost to um, a, a appropriate uh, agencies, et cetera. Linda, were you trying to come in then with a, with a, with a point? Uh, yes, I'm not sure that uh, Steve could uh, hear, hear what I was trying to say. Oh, um, sorry, Linda. No, I didn't hear you at all. Apologies. No, that, that's all right. Um, uh, just a couple of, of points on this. With the school uniform, I know that many schools have already relaxed um, what their expectations might have been of parents coming up to the beginning of the, uh, of the new academic year. So if you don't know as a governor whether your school has said, don't worry about the branded aspect, you can wear a navy blue t-shirt for, for PE, for example, it's worth clarifying that. And if you get the... the um, the same information that parents get, then that might be helpful. But the other point I was going to make is that last bullet point, point about all staff fully trained in recognizing the needs, because sometimes what we have, uh, what we're looking at, we might be thinking from a safeguarding point of view might be neglect, but it might simply be hardship. And so all staff working collectively, so for example, your midday, midday meal supervisor, 
doctors may notice that a particular child is going up for seconds more than they had, or they haven't got much in their lunchbox compared to what they used to have. It might be that um, somebody in the playground that's supervising the children at, at playtime notices that a child's um, shoes are looking, um, you know, uh, that they need replacing. Uh, and, and along with the uniform, your school might have said, you don't have to have a separate pair of school shoes, you can wear black trainers and they, you know, they're going to be used after school as well. It's about the relationships between all staff in understanding and supporting their uh, parents. But I think we also have to recognise as, as governors, there's a great deal of pride um, around uh, for people who have fallen into hardship through no fault of their own. We are talking largely around parents who are having some measure of work um, and they are, they are proud enough to want to be able to uh, to do this on their own. So the sorts of things that need to be put in place must be carefully uh, considered by the school leadership team. And whilst we might have some good ideas as governors, we are not on the ground in terms of what might work and what might be helpful. Great, thanks, Linda. Sorry about the uh, um, loss of sound there for a moment. Okay, thank you. Uh, could we move on? Yes, thank you. Ollie, um, sorry, the, back, the background picture here, I think, is actually Jodrell Bank, actually, and the idea is that uh, there are, well, there will be from time to time, uh, one or two things that actually should also be cropping up on our radar, again, mostly dependent on the, um, the context of our schools to a great extent. And again, I've not, this is not intended as an exhaustive list on this slide, but these are some of the things which we can't forget about. We can't let things drop off the uh, off, off the radar in governance um, because we are accountable, and these are matters of compliance, of course, for us. Uh, we know that attendance, for example, was a major theme in the education white paper earlier this year. Now, whilst the schools bill itself has actually stalled somewhat uh, uh, dramatically at the moment, uh, attendance hasn't. And attendance, we've already seen regulations, new regulations come out of the department earlier in the year, and new statutory guidance on attendance has actually come out. So if you haven't looked at that and looked at the implications of that in your school or your trust, again, that's something that we would urge you as governors to make sure does crop up on the agenda. Curriculum development never goes away. The curriculum isn't static, of course. And therefore, as governors, we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that you know, this is still the backbone of the Ofsted inspection framework, that we don't do these things that we do as governors because Ofsted are coming or we think they might be coming. We do them because our children and young people in our schools deserve the best possible um, outcomes and therefore they deserve the best possible um, curriculum to support those outcomes. So as governors, we, do, we shouldn't lose sight of that either. Um, Again, linked back to the white paper and, of course, um, the schools bill. And I know there's a session um, in the Governors for Schools uh, conference actually looking at uh, this a little bit later, but the academization question. The only reason I would actually put this here as keeping it on the radar, be aware of what's going on. But also the caveat here is do not let considerations of structure, which is basically what academization is all about, don't let those detract governance or school leadership for that matter away from the prime responsibility and that's the one that linda talked about on our uh, um, fourth slide today we are there to you know, relentlessly drive outcomes for uh, children and young people in our schools diverting a lot of time and effort to think about academization if when what is going to happen there isn't sensible for any governing body so it's just about putting that into context uh, staff workload and well-being has already been talked about in the first session of uh, the Governors for Schools conference this morning. Don't forget about it, please don't. Um, staff workload has come under huge pressure in the, uh, the last two and a half, almost three years now um, because of the pandemic. But an awful lot of local authorities are pushing or trying to push an awful lot of additional responsibilities onto schools at the moment. And I think as governors, we need to be thinking about our duty of care for all staff in our schools, head teachers and leadership teams, but everybody else as well. And we need to be protecting their, uh, their interests wherever we can. And not losing sight of workload issues and uh, well-being of staff is a really important part of that. 
one of the things that I didn't mention that but something that could potentially be a, a casualty of the financial um, pressures on schools at the moment, of course, is the CPD budget, the money we spend on staff training and professional development. In many, many organisations, when times get tough in terms of finance, the first thing that gets cut is staff training. We work in schools as governors, we give our time freely to work in our schools. Schools are all about learning. The last thing we should ever do is see dramatic cuts in staff training. Um, it means that we lose sight of uh, the main game here, which of course is improving pupil outcomes. And if we don't allow staff to engage in professional development, which brings them up to speed with the latest developments in their profession, um, we are doing a disservice to the children and young people in our schools. And I have put Ofsted there. I mean, we're not, you know, we're, we don't do what we do, as we've said a couple of times this morning, because Ofsted are coming, but we have to be mindful. Where are we in our Ofsted uh, cycle? Um, and if Ofsted are coming, you know, we should always be ready for Ofsted, but there are a few things that, uh, as governors, we need to make sure that we are mindful of uh, in terms of our preparedness for inspection when it does arrive in our schools. And that brings us to uh, the next slide, which is all about preparing for those challenges ahead. And these are just a few tips really to um, pull the threads of this session that uh, Linda and I have uh, led for you this morning together. Firstly, for each and every one of us, um, obviously you're here this morning and that's a great testimony to uh, uh, your engagement in your own professional development. And we do thank you sincerely for that, but continue to think about your own development and the training that you access and also be a champion for other governors in engaging in training. I'm sure like me, you are um, governor in one or more boards where you know, there will be quite a groundswell of enthusiasm for training and professional development, but there'll always be one or two people who don't. Um, we should start evangelizing more on this. The more that we prepare ourselves as governors, the better we are um, equipped to be able to serve our schools. So taking that forward, don't just go to training, but actually do your own research, read around education, look at some of the things that are happening at the moment. And again, one of the, the biggest pieces of news as far as education is concerned this year has been the white paper. But if you're maybe a desperately sad person like me who spends too much time on social media and too much time researching, you will know that the um, schools bill, which came out of the white paper, that's now stalled. There is no time for it to be debated in the House of Lords for the rest of this calendar year. So that's something that we do need to actually think about. Stimulate thinking by talking to others. Um, we're living in a, you know, an increasingly um, uh, virtual world at the moment, as far as governance is concerned, but try to get those networking opportunities with other governors, talk to other governors, hear their views, etc., because that helps us in terms of uh, improving our own practice. Engage in, if there are additional working parties, additional meetings, etc., um, particularly on finance, I'm thinking here, but make sure that you are part of that process. And of course, preparation is absolutely everything. We've seen, I think, a massive improvement in the quality of governor's preparation for meetings during the pandemic. Let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater on that. Okay, and that one more slide. Thank you, Ollie. Um, just a very quick reminder, and I don't need to um, yeah, talk you through this one. This is really just a little reference to take away from. Effective meetings are an indicator of effective governance in our schools. And this is just really um, final thread pulling, if you like. These are some of the things that we've talked about already. Um, but as I say, if you do get hold of the handout, hopefully you'll find that's uh, um, a little better quality than the rest of this session. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Steve and Linda. As ever, a really comprehensive and helpful session for us as we face quite challenging circumstances in the schools. Just a reminder that um, if you do want a certificate from the CPD Certification Service, there will be a, a quick survey coming up after this webinar. So fill in your details there and, and, and uh, give us permission to share your details with the CPD service and they'll send you a certificate within 28 days. Thanks again for your attendance this morning and we hope you can make it to another Governors for Schools event very soon. Cheers, Stephen and Linda. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye -bye.